Welcome to E3. Spirituality is hinged on the degree to which you align yourself to the principles of scriptures. Praise God. And it is very important in our days today, you know, it's easy for, for someone to come up here and make statements that undermine reason, that undermine scientific thought in the name of spirituality. Praise God. That's why it's important that we talk about these things. There is actually something we call the biblical worldview. That's a worldview that is influenced by biblical principles. So the degree to which your life mirrors biblical worldview is the degree to which we say you are spiritual. Hallelujah. Are we here today? Like I promised, this week I'll be talking about faith and reason are not binary opposite. Faith and reason are not binary opposite. Or spirituality and reason, rationality, objectivity are not binary opposite. They are not in conflict. Faith and reason are not in conflict. It's, it's important that we, we have this thought because these are the things that shape our worldview. You know, there's, there's a, a body of believers who just anything that is science-oriented, anything that is outside of the established idea of what faith and spirituality is, cannot be within the context of the will of God or cannot be within the context of our spiritual reality. Praise God. And that's what I'm here to say today, that that is not correct. So faith and reason are not opposite. They are not binary opposite. There's actually a confluence of both. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Undermining scientific reality does not make you more spiritual. Just in line with the thought of last week. Undermining scientific reality does not make you more spiritual. You are not more spiritual to the degree to which you doubt the reality of science and reason. You know, Bishop Yerikba used to say one thing. He said, make, it's a quote from E.W. Kenyon. He said, make your brain walk, it will sweat. Make your brain walk, it will sweat. And that God gave you a brain so you can give him rest. Praise God. Praise God. So undermining reasoning and discretion is biblical definition of a fool. A man that is lacking in wisdom. A man that is lacking in discretion. Praise God. It's not the biblical definition of spirituality. So the degree to which you undermine reason... The degree to which you refuse to put your brain to work is classical, proverbial definition of who a fool is. That's, you know, I don't know where we got the idea that that is what being spiritual is. The hearing a voice in your head I claim to be the voice of God is not the order that God has set for us to live. The spirit of man is the candlelight of the Lord, right? Is that a scripture? So when the Lord wants to deal with you, when the Lord wants to speak with you, he lightens up your spirit and you catch a hunch. You know in your heart that, yeah, this is the Lord speaking to me. Do people hear voices once in a while? Yes, but that's a very rare exception. Not even some of the biggest evangelical ministers in the world, Archbishop B.A. Dalsa, E.W. Kenyon, heard voices from the very literal sense. Praise God. So undermining reason, objective reasoning, and rationality is, to a large extent, from a proverbial standpoint or from ecclesiastical standpoint, is the definition of who a fool is. It's not the definition of being spiritual. So let nobody deceive you that when you, when, you, when you undermine reason, you know, I've always heard these things are spiritual, these things are, you know, people say, people are very quick to make those kind of statements without giving us an understanding of what they mean by these things are spiritual. 
Like I said last week, you can be far advanced in scientific reasoning and still be very spiritual. You can be far advanced. You know, I've always used the example of Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle himself and Charles, uh, you know, Boyle's theory in chemistry, foundational chemistry, Boyle's theory, that man, he committed his life to the advancement of the gospel. Go and read about him. All his wealth, he, he willed them for, for evangelical purposes. That every money that came to his estate after his death will be used for the propagation of the gospel. So you can be scientifically advanced. You can, you can and still be very spiritual. Praise God. They are not binary opposites. Why? Because spirituality and objectivity are actually not opposing ideas. Undermining objectivity, rational thinking, in the name of spirituality is the same error as undermining spirituality and faith in the name of science. So when you undermine science, when you undermine rational thinking, when you undermine objectivity in the name of being spiritual, you are equally a fool as the man who says he's a scientist, he believes in rational thinking, he believes in objective thinking, and undermines spirituality. For man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus did not say man shall not live by bread. He used the word alone. So bread is key, is, is critical for your survival. Praise God. Are you with me here? And for me, when Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone, he draws a line of a 50-50 division. So man shall live by bread together with every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is in the realm of spirituality, while bread is in the realm of science and reason. So you shall not live by bread alone. There must be a confluence or a congruence of both, a conflation of both for you to survive. Praise God. So who is a balanced Christian? Who is a balanced believer? A balanced Christian or a balanced believer is someone who takes the words of Jesus into his reality. That man shall not live by bread alone. He shall live by bread and by every word imagine of the, the two realities. Hallelujah. Are you with me today? You know, we cannot be more righteous than Jesus. It was Jesus that said that. That you cannot live by bread alone. Hallelujah. So when, now the first one, the, the, like I, I, I let me repeat that statement. Undermining objectivity and rational thinking in the name of spirituality is the same error as undermining spirituality in the name of scientific reasoning. The first one, that's the undermining of objectivity, makes you superstitious and stupid. While the second one makes you mundane, immoral, and foolish. Praise God. So if you see a man who says God does not exist because of what he thinks science has done in the universe, he's a fool. Right? So if you see a man who says, oh, everything is spirit and undermine the reality of our scientific experience or scientific and objective reasoning, he too is a fool. He too is a fool. Praise God. So if you don't want to be a fool, you must bring to, to bear both in your reality. When both of them conflate, it produces a grave, balanced, doctrinally sound, psychologically balanced believer. You know, I consider myself balanced enough because I know where to draw the line between superstition and faith. Right? You know, that's why I'm, I'm quick to share my, my personal experiences and my personal testimony of my work with God so that people will know that you can be very cerebral and still be spiritual. And that's the mold of Christians that we are raising in the house of grace. You'll be very cerebral and still be 
spiritual. Hallelujah. Scriptural provision shows that reasonable congress shows a reasonable congress between faith and, re, uh, and spirituality and faith and reason. Hallelujah. This message has become necessary due to the way many believers have reacted since the onset of the pandemic and subsequent lockdowns. Praise God. We are not at war with science. Spiritual encounter, this is the words of Austin of Yahweh, one of our senior pastors that I, I really loved, you know. Spiritual encounter does not mean you have grown spiritually. I'm sure you know that. That you heard a voice that sounded like the voice of God does not mean you are very spiritual. And I've always used the, the experience of Balaam to tell you, the fact that God spoke through you does not mean you are very spiritual. After all, God spoke through a donkey. Abi, oh, will you say the donkey was very spiritual? Oh, the donkey was in the spirit. He was, the donkey was in the spirit. It, will, will you say that? So the fact that you are having spiritual encounters is not a proof that now you are spiritual. It's not. God can speak to you. You can, you can call down fire from heaven. It's not an evidence of spirituality. That is not the biblical standard for spirituality. Hallelujah. Unsaved men can have spiritual encounters with angels or devils. It does not make them spiritual. Does it? Have you forgotten Cornelius? Did an angel not appear before Cornelius? Was he born again at that time? Are we together in church, please? An angel, Cornelius had an encounter with an angel, and what happened? The angel directed him to receive Peter. Because he must go through the process for salvation. It's not just, oh, I, you know, if it was in these days, an angel visited Cornelius, he would have started a ministry without being born again. Oh, you don't, you don't know? You see, you see, go and read history. I've read about even popes and Anglican priests, high Anglican priests who are atheists. The administrative duty of the office brought them into that position. But they have doubt even about the reality of God. You know, imagine that. An angel, imagine myself, even me now, without this understanding. An angel appeared to me. Ah, I will create a shrine in that location. And I will be visiting that location every day to go and receive, to reenact the angelic visit. You know, I, I had a teasing experience with some of my friends. You know, you know, they were talking about, oh, in every home, you must, have, you must have a space in a house where you have your quiet time. It's called the family altar. Oh, I said, oh, you mean you have a shrine in your house? He said, no, 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 you don't. Ah, you don't understand. You know, ah, when, you, when you go there, you see that. I said, it's called neuro-associated conditioning. Praise God. <laughs> you say, no, when you just go into that part of the house, because that's where you have fellowship every time, you feel the presence of God. I said, no, it's neural associated conditioning. It's the same way I train my dog. If I say sit down, you sit down and I give him fish or chicken. He eats it. Anytime I use the word sit down, in his mind, chicken is about to come. So he sit down quickly, and I give him chicken. So as I keep doing that, after a while, I start removing the chicken. But when I say sit down, because he is expecting chicken, he sits down. So he say, ah, the dog is very intelligent. I just program him. So the same thing. So when I go into that corner of my house, and I do what I think is spiritual, I, you know, I do all those things. There's a way I feel that, oh, the presence of God is here. I, I feel that way. Praise God. So guess what? So in my brain, that part of the house becomes associated with that feeling. So when I enter that part of the house, instantly, I start having that feeling. I'm sorry. I'm sure I'm offending some people here who... <laughs> You know, you know the, our, our role, our aim in this church is to save people eh, 
From what? The bondage of religion. So spiritual encounter does not mean that you have grown spiritually. Now you had an angelic visit does not mean you have become very spiritual. Angels visit people who are not even born again. Praise God. Spirituality should never be presumed in dealing with people who are into ministry that is encounters driven. Many are having engagement with devils masquerading as angels. Encounter driven, you know, when you have that encounter, you felt the presence of angels. Ah, you felt it. They, they are here. They are here. Praise God. Am I communicating with you today? You know, the reason why I'm saying all this is that your, your, your faith must be grounded, must be founded on proper principles. It must be grounded. Hallelujah. They are masquerading as angels of light to confuse and mislead many away from salvation. Like I said last week, spirituality is the degree to which we are aligned with the principles of Jesus Christ as espoused by the eternal words of God in scriptures. That's what spirituality is about. It is a confusion of the alignment between faith and reason that makes people, especially church people, upset when, for example, when we teach about financial successes in church, when we encourage believers to participate in politics. You know, one of the things we get criticism for when we teach about personal development and business success, they say we are not teaching the gospel. We are not teaching Christianity. In fact, I went somewhere. My wife was there. I was speaking, and one of the senior ministers behind me just shouted, MBA. Praise God. You know, I don't tire. I tire. I just tire for that. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just tire for all these people. <laughs> I tire, I don't tire. <laughs> Praise God. They just get angry. And you know, sometimes I think I have a broad base of um, listening to pastors. I listen to a lot of pastors. Papa even said that he listens to fools, so he learns how not to be fooled. Like the reason why I listen to fools so that he will know how not to be, be a fool. So I, I, I listen to a lot of pastors, and um, in, this, in this time and age, it's looking like um, your depth of spirituality is the degree to which you, you infuse the name of Jesus in your words. The message is only the gospel where you infuse the name of Jesus everywhere as we are speaking, right? That, that, that's, the, that's the presumption. Praise God. Now, Hebrews 11 verse 3 says that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by things which do appear. That means that things which are seen were made of things which are not seen, right? That's what it means. Things which are seen are made of things which are not seen. That's the summary of this scripture. Things which are seen speaks of our physical universe. Praise God. Things which are seen, our physical universe, were made of things which are not seen. The spiritual reality, right? Praise God. Now, if your physical universe was born out of a spiritual reality, that means invariably your physical universe is a manifestation of a spiritual reality. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? If our physical reality, if our physical universe were born out of a spiritual reality, for the world, the worlds, the world there speaks of the universe, the entire cosmos, were framed by the words of God so that the things which are seen Physical universe. Where men were not made of things which do appear. That means that the things which are seen were made by the words of God which we cannot see. That means 
that our physical world is a manifestation of a spiritual reality. Now, if your physical world is a manifestation of a, phys- a spiritual reality, that means it is spiritual, right? That means our world is spiritual. If I call, call somebody here now, and I lay my hands on the person, and the person is manifesting and turning around, they will say, oh, people will say, I am very spiritual, I'm power- it's spiritually powerful, right? Why? Because you are seeing the manifestation. Are you with me, please? Is everybody in church today? You are seeing the manifestation. Now, taking allusion from that, what you are seeing in the world, in the physical world, is a manifestation of the spiritual. The world were framed by the words of God. So our physical world is a manifestation of the spiritual. Praise God. They were created out of a higher spiritual reality. Now, our physical world has three elements, the biology, the physics, and the chemistry. Praise God. Our physical world has three elements, the biology, the physics, and the chemistry. I know laws of chemistry, laws of physics, laws of biology are inviolable. They are a manifestation of a higher spiritual reality. Are you with me? For example, people who hate God have tried to redefine this reality. That's why, you know, um, no matter how hard humanists and atheists say that a man is a woman due to transgenderism, it can never be a woman. That is against every principle of biology, right? Praise God, now are you here. You know, it's not about how people feel. It's not about how the world can be angry. They how dare you. I say, I'm a man. I'm a man. I say, no, your, your, your genotype is XY. XX. Praise God. You can even use surgery and remove all the genitalia, but the gene, the gene, the ingredient is female. You see it? Why? Because God's laws are eternal. And the biological law that established that reality is inviolable. You cannot violate it. You can only suppress it for some time. You get it. So they can tell you that, oh, a male is a a female, a female is a male. It must align with biology. So biology, chemistry, and physics are the summation of our human effort to understand the spiritual dimensions of our earth. The principles established by the Spirit, by God. When I say by the Spirit, in the sense, by God. So if the scientific world was created out of the super spiritual, it then means that irrefutable scientific principles and laws have their origin in the Spirit. Are you still in church? If our world were made by God, by the words of God... It means that our world is a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality, right? Now, what do we do in science? We only try to understand the compositions and constitution of our world. We are only trying to understand the world. The principle that makes the GSM technology possible was there when Adam was made. Praise God. Are you in church? They were there when Adam was made. So all science is trying to do is understand the intricate workings of the spirit. You know, that's why I say that many things we call spiritual today are actually scientific. They are advanced science. We have not reached there, so it's spiritual. In those days, before GSM started, when your sister traveled or your brother traveled to abroad, America, and there is something in the family that they need to do, to let him know. There's no telephone. So they'll go and meet one native doctor. And the native doctor, maybe the person's name is James. So he's start calling it James. So James, he'll start doing incantations. And all of a sudden, maybe in America, the guy will not feel uncomfortable and enter a boat 
or a plane and come to Nigeria. Abby, but today, do you need to do that? Just use your GSM and call him. Abby, ah, is that not? <laughs> How many of you still tell prayer warriors to help you pray about one uncle that, if the man is too difficult, go to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you will find him there. If you are really desperate, just post that you are looking for a man like this who disappeared from your family 30 years ago. We don't know whether he's still alive. Post it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I tell you, before 24 hours, you'll get people who tell you that, oh, ah, I know this man, he's in uh, one village in Australia. So many of the things we thought were spiritual in those days were just advanced science. Because the Bible does not define spirituality against the backdrop of those manifestations. So you will be in the same boat of fools if you undermine the reality of scientific reasoning. Just like the man who undermined the reality of spiritual thoughts and faith will be. You are in the same boat. Praise God. So the theorems and hypotheses of science are only human attempts at understanding and explaining the principles set by God for the governing of our physical reality, governing of our physical universe. It therefore cannot be anti-God. You know, you know, the last time I preached a sermon on the conference of science and, and religion, I made very strong statement here. I know many people didn't like it. I know that uh, when people hear me say such things, they just wonder what has come. In fact, if, if Bishop was teasing me recently, so sad, he said, are you sure you are still a Christian? Because I'm like, you know, they invited me somewhere to come and preach. It's a very, one of the biggest churches in Nigeria, you know. It was a youth conference, and um, thank God it was not a very large gathering, so I just say, let me tickle their minds a little. So I asked them a very simple question. Praise God. You know how many people malaria drug has healed annually? Do you know? It runs into billions, right? So can you calculate all? the healing miracles of all the pastors in the world, put them together. Will it be up to one-tenth? So who seems to be doing more miracles? All the headaches that paracetamol has healed. Who seems to be doing more miracles? You know, the problem is that when I talk like this, it's as if I am denigrating the, the value of that experience of being sick and somebody lays hands on you and prays and you say, oh, I got healed. Come on now. If it's malaria, Kuaten would have done that. If it was headache, Prasitamo would have done that. Do you understand? Ah. Are you here today? I know this is not, it's not popular with us as Christians, but this is a reality. You know, we undermine the magic of a doctor putting a woman, a pregnant woman, on a theater, use knife, split her stomach open, remove a living child, saw the woman again, and the woman will be living normally, and the child will be alive and everything. You know, we just undermine it. We just undermine it. We just, for us, that is not as important as when a pastor, the woman is having labor pain. Oh, pastor, uh, doctor say it will be cesarean. Oh, then I now pray with you, and you, the, the child just comes out. You consider that a bigger miracle? Sorry, don't be angry with me, oh. You know, that's why I encourage everybody, every member in this church to, in line with your faith in Christ Jesus, pursue very strong social and scientific realities. Pursue it. Pursue it. The reason why the world looks confused and uh, it looks like um, uh, all the science in the world are trying to attack our faith is because we, men of faith, are... Uh, abdicated our responsibility in the field of science. 
You say you are so born again, you are so spirit-filled. The power of revelation should be used to discover cure for COVID-19. It's not for you to go and say, bring them, let me lay hands on them. See, let me tell you, eh, the miraculous is not the order that God has set for the healing of the nations. The miraculous is not. I bet you, the miraculous is not the order that God has set. It's an exception. Sorry. Sorry now. It's an exception. Let me leave that subject. Praise God. <laughs> God has relied on scientific revelation to humans as a tool for the continued perpetration of life in the physical universe. That's hard. God has relied on scientific revelations in the hands of humans as a tool for the advancement of the human race. You remember that in the 19th, or, yeah, in the 19th century, one economist said that, look, oh, the way things are going now, the human race will outnumber our capacity for production, and there will be hunger and famine and great cataclysm, and so on and so forth. But guess what? The human race keeps growing. Think about it. There were famine when the world was just a hundred million. Now, if there was famine in some parts of the world when the world was a hundred million, how come there's no famine when we are almost eight billion? We are always expanding. And those thoughts come by revelation, by divine revelation, by divine revelation. You must know that. So guess what? By the instrumentality of divine revelation in the field of science. Divine revelation in the field of science. The human race will keep being perpetrated upon the face of the earth. When we get to 100 billion people, I'm sure you know we'll get there. Oh, you don't know? You know, I don't share all those ideas that, oh, the world is coming to, uh, Antichrist will soon be revealed, though. I don't have those, uh, I don't share those um, I, yeah, I, will take, I, I just want the lockdown to be eased so that I will take time and do a very thorough teaching on the second coming of Jesus, the eschatological thoughts. I, you know, I believe that 3,000 years will still be here. Praise God. That's, see, it's, see you believe me. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. <laughs> you will be history by then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and guess what? By then, you know what we would have done? We would have discovered new frontiers. You know, I just read recently that they are finding tardigradas. Um, you know, in zoology, there's what we call tardigrada. Uh, tardigrades are some of the most difficult living organisms that can survive the most difficult conditions. You find tardigrades in the bottom of the sea. The bottom of the sea, they are in the, the, I think they are in the protozoan family, the bottom tardigrada. They are found tardigradas in the moon, Abi, yeah, or in the moon or in Mars. I think in the moon, in the surface of the moon. That some of the lunar uh, probes exploded in the, uh, when they were living from the earth, they carried tardigrades. Tardigrada. Go, just check online, say, what are tardigrades? So, guess what we will do? By revelations, we will discover new civilizations. By revelations, people will start going to the moon. We'll start building houses in the moon. They will start living in the moon. Praise God. I know that's scary, right? No, it's just, it's just the way it is God that put it there like that. So let me just leave that matter because it's scaring some of you now. So I will repeat this statement that God has relied on scientific revelation to humans as a tool for the continued perpetration of life in the physical universe. Therefore, without science, the continued existence of life on earth cannot be guaranteed. And without faith and spirituality, humans will be bound to self-destruct. Maybe many of you don't really know that there's just one nuclear head that can alter the structure of the earth and destroy everything. You don't know? It is when they saw it, the wicked 
people came together and said, look, the way we are going, eh, we will destroy this Eto by ourselves. Let us sign treaties, new, n- nuclear non-proliferation treaty, that nobody will be allowed to make this bomb. It's too bad. It is too bad. It is too bad. And guess what? The nuclear head that was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we, the, America and Russia, they have nuclear warheads that are 10 times more powerful than that. Nagasaki in those days were like, it's just like Lagos. Where they drop a nuclear weapon and people effervesced, they disintegrated, they melted within some distance from this uh, point zero. So guess what? Without faith, humans will self-destruct. Without science, our continued existence on earth cannot be guaranteed. You see how God rely on science? science? Scientific revelations as tools in the hands of men for the perpetuation of humanity. Are you with me, please? You can therefore see that science and faith are not binary opposites. Spirituality and reasoning are not opposing ends. A conference of both are needed for a meaningful life. Colossians 3, 1 to 17. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things beneath. Ye are dead, and your life is hid in Christ Jesus, in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the face of the earth. So when the Bible talks about seek things which are above, the opposite of things which are above are things which are on earth. And this scripture is a classical definition of biblical spirituality. Right? Praise God. So it is not hinged on angelic encounters. It is hinged on the degree to which you mortify yourself and align yourself with established biblical principles. And he just said some, your members which are upon the face of the earth are all this, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, um, for which things sake the wrath of God is coming. These are the things which are on earth, right? Verse 7. In which you walk when you, in time past, when you lived in them. Verse 8. But now, ye also put off these things, anger and all that, a continuation of the things which are on earth. Go on, verse 9. Lie not one of them, verse 10. Verse 10. And put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. The new man is the spiritual man. The new man is the spiritual man, and it is not gender or race-based. The new man is a spiritual man. Go on, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. These are the things you should set your affection on. If ye walk in the spirit, to be spiritual, these are the things that you set your affections on. Put on the new man, holy and beloved, boys of mercy, kindness, humbleness, mind, meekness. These are the things which are above. Just, just go on, verse 13. Verse 13. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against one another, verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You see, these scriptures are what spirituality is about. It's the sum total of what it means to be spiritual. So follow them. Reasoning and faith are not binary opposites. Spirituality and objectivity or scientific thought are not opposite ends. Science has enriched our life and our physical experiences. Faith has given our lives meaning. May God grant you understanding. Amen. Put your hands together for Jesus.